I've been looking for patterns, how to describe and think about what's working, and and uh, trying different ways. All of us who've been thinking about this have been trying trying different ways of explaining it to people, understanding it ourselves, uh, to turn these ideas and these sensations that we have that the world is changing, that citizens can participate, that our institutions can can do more, trying to put words around that so we can use those ideas as tools. And, and I keep coming back to these three ideas, scope, scale, and speed. So scope is what we choose to work on, and we have choices. We have a choice. It's not, nowhere is it written in the laws of the universe that we must work a certain way. We come to work each morning, you and I, and we do a job, and that job could be different. Scale is how big that work can be, not just in terms of many consumers reached, but impact in society, depth of impact on individuals, and then speed is how quickly it can happen. And I think that Fundamentally and constitutionally, the world has changed in those three dimensions, scope, scale, and speed. The scale and the speed should come back and teach us a new lesson about the scope, what we dream of accomplishing. So much of my thinking and work when I wake up at night and have dreams and um, am spacing out on the train and reading, I'm thinking about how these three things fit together. Uh, and how to build these concepts into a toolkit that you and I and our colleagues can use to do better, better more, to accomplish more in society. The, the scale piece is very interesting to me. Um, I think as uh, our primate minds have evolved to think in a certain range of scale very comfortably. Um, we can know about 100 people, we can know a certain geographic area. We can think clearly about one or a hundred or a thousand of something. But when you get beyond a certain point, the ideas are very abstract. And they don't come naturally to us. And we need to train to get good at them. We need to practice. Was it Aristotle who said something like, we, we are what we celebrate? Um, and a, a physical therapist I know said, we get what we practice. You, know, you get what you practice. So, so this thinking in new ways about scale is very challenging. Um, I mentioned the TED Talks earlier. The TED Conference has served a billion videos. That's a big number. There's nothing about the organization of TED that a museum couldn't duplicate, couldn't have duplicated. It's a very simple concept. Short talks from great thinkers. The TED team I don't know that they understood the power of global of video, but they had a, a hunch. They started experimenting with putting a few videos online in 2006, and now they've got a billion videos served. Um, the Wikimedia projects have had almost two billion edits now with no central control. Um, I'm very interested in the MOOC movement, massively open online courses. They're not so much known in uh, museum leadership circles. It's, it's an emerging idea. Um, a, uh, a Princeton University professor recently taught a sociology, introduction to sociology class that he's taught for many years at Princeton, but he offered it online for free to anyone in the world. I don't remember the exact number of participants, but it was easily over 70, 80,000 people signed up to take this course online. So that's a big number. The most interesting thing about it to me was that the professor said he got more useful feedback on the class in the first week or two than he had received in 20 years of teaching the class at Princeton University. Sociology, many of the topics that our museums and libraries and archives celebrate have um, benefit from a multiplicity of perspectives, global perspectives, cultural perspectives. The more people we involve in those conversations, the richer the dialogue 
can be, the more quickly we can advance our understanding of these topics. So something, one of the great physicists, I think it was um, Richard Feynman, said there's something different about big. And I'm not arguing that everything needs to be about bigness, but just that there's a lot of beneficial work that can be done in society by thinking about big. By thinking, I, I don't just want big, I want more of everything. I often get asked, well, that's great for the Smithsonian Institution, the world's largest museum and research complex, to talk about working big. But how does that relate to my museum? Most museums in the United States, and um, we're the American Alliance of Museums is recalculating how many museums there are. They think there may be 40,000 museums in the US. The average staff size is three or four people. The tiny. Um, how do we work big? We can't even. We don't have a webmaster. We don't have a. You know, wh what does this mean for us? Um, all of the examples that I found, almost all of the examples that I found about ideas, projects that have scaled globally and benefited from an audience of participants, um, are very small teams. I would argue it's even a disadvantage to be big. The big organizations can't get out of their own way fast enough to communicate clearly with global audiences often. Um, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of smart history, SM art history by Beth Harris uh, and Steven Zucker. They're both art history professors. Uh, Beth is a museum professional. They became frustrated by the lack of good art history information online. There's a lot of information. There's some excellent information being produced by museums and individuals, but they felt there could be more. So they started making it themselves. With an annual tech budget of about $700 and a clear vision of how easy it is to produce web video. I mean, look at you, Rui. We're here, a guy in a camera, and earphones, and you're going to reach a global audience of, you are reaching a global audience of, of web uh, museum experts. Very simple. You don't have to buy servers, you don't have to rack servers. They understood this. They started creating content. Um, Beth has said, as professors, we could reach 200 students a semester. Last semester, smart history videos reached 750,000 learners. They're now part of the Khan Academy. The Khan Academy is, a, is a, basically an online, I won't say a university, it's an online learning space started by Salman Khan. He has a wonderful TED talk that should be required viewing in any museum leadership team. Um, that project started with one guy teaching his nieces and nephews math. When he wasn't with them, he thought, well, I'll just record a video of these concepts. And what's the best way to share video? YouTube. So he put them on YouTube. He found two things. He found that his cousins, uh, nieces and nephews, preferred the online hymn to the actual hymn because they could watch his talks at their own pace whenever they wanted to. They could rewind and rewatch parts of the instruction. And he also found he started getting email and comments from people all over the world who were also learning from his videos. Um, David Lee King is a librarian in the US who runs a virtual library branch in Kansas. He said, it's as easy for me to share a video with everyone in the world, a book review, than it is to share it with just my residents of Topeka, Kansas. Um, so Beth and Stephen are now part of the Khan Academy. I love the way Salman Khan talks. He says, he says um, sure, we serve 1.2 million users a month, more or less. Um, we have this many hundred hours of video. Now I want to talk to you about what we're going to do when we get really big. So uh, this idea, I think about Kickstarter, which has funded uh, $2.3 million of projects last year, using contributions from people in 177 countries. All these projects are very easy to produce. They don't need big teams. They need the idea, first and foremost, that they can work globally, open, quickly on the internet.
there's another aspect of this. As you and I have been talking, I'm so aware of the importance of one-to-one -one interaction. And I think I, I, that is always going to be important. And, and we know that deep, deep learning, certain kinds of deep learning, certain kinds of citizenship happen best in small groups working locally. The challenge is how to scale that. Um, I think the, the Wikimedia model of a global organization, open, with an open governance structure, with a very clear call to action. Wikipedia is very simple um, and has been consistently simple since its founding. But that allows local chapters, local individuals, people to meet, enjoy the um, camaraderie and collegiality of working together, can, can inspire each other at the local level and interpret the big mission to their local interests. I think that model is amazingly powerful and scalable. Um, if you were to, if we were, to, someone was to come to us and say, you know, Michael Rui, there's this new thing where we have a hundred, we have 44,000 organizations in the United States dedicated to um, the increase in diffusion of knowledge, uh, maintaining history, building cultural connections. What could we do? That would be an incredible gift. That's museums in the U.S. 44,000 roughly museums. There are 140 something thousand libraries in the U.S. What an opportunity to build personal local connections around a global call to action. That's an incredible head start. And society has been very smart in maintaining that. Now is the moment when we need to transition. We, we need to step on the gas. <laughs>